if anyone tells you that graduating from the liberal arts honors program is not going to make you president someday, let me change your mind about that. I'd like to introduce a graduate from the class of 1980, Father Brian Shanley, president of Providence College. <laughs> Welcome, Father Shanley. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lynch. If the truth be told, when I used to think about coming back to Providence College, the job that I wanted was not the one that I have. It's Dr. Lynch's job. <laughs> I wanted to be the director of the honors program. That was one of my dream jobs. And my last executive act when I leave Providence College, or I leave the presidency, is I'm going to make myself the head of the honors program, <laughs> just, just so you know. Whenever that is, that's going to be the last thing on my pen as I hereby appoint Father Brian Shinley, director of the honors program. It was my dream job because it was really the most transformative experience of my life in terms of my mind and my heart was the honors program at Providence College. And I'm pleased tonight that we have one of my classmates, Jane Gonzalez, who is going to speak. And I was kind of tallying up the list of, well, are we the best class in the history of the honors program, but then I saw three class of 61s have spoken here, and Jack Partridge has spoken twice. So I'm going to also order Dr. Lynch to invite me back and Dr. Rousseau uh, so that we can be the best class in the history of the honors program. I do want to salute the class of 61, however, because they are the pioneers. They were the ones who started it. And I want to especially thank Jack Partridge, who has really spearheaded the fundraising efforts that we've done to enhance the program. I'm really jealous about these European trips that you guys take right now. We didn't have that back in our day. We just sat around that Woodrow Wilson table and talked about really deep things. We didn't get to actually see the things that we were talking about. I went on our first alumni tour a couple of weeks ago, and I got to Athens for the first time in my life. And I've taught Greek philosophy for years and years, and I read the Apology in the honors program my, my freshman year. And I thought, wow, I've been dreaming about Athens since 1976 in Western Civ at Providence College around the Woodrow Wilson table. And now I finally see it. And I almost got to my knees. I was so thrilled to finally be there. And you guys are so blessed to have these trips now, and, and we could not do that without the support of the people who have donated to that. So that coming alive experience, which we've all had when you go abroad, is a critical way of connecting your education with what it is that's out there, if you will, in the real world. Uh, I was talking with an alum tonight, um, and he was talking about memories of teachers at Providence College. And I've been to school for a long time. I've completed, I think, 26 grades uh, with various things I've done in between. And some of the best teachers I ever had, I had here. And they are in this room, but I'm not going to name anybody because there's some other teachers I had while I was here that wouldn't be on the list. But most of them that are on the list are here. Uh, and it's really, it's the experience of teaching and learning that changed my life. I came to Providence College wanting to be a lawyer, and I know there are a lot of lawyers in the room, including uh, Mr. Partridge. And then I decided I wanted to be a history professor, like Dr. Grace, who was the head of the program when I was here. Uh, then I figured out I was supposed to do uh, what I'm doing now. But I always wanted to be a teacher, and I would not have been a priest if I couldn't have been a teacher, because I love both of them. And I love both of them because when I was here, both of those things changed my life, the priests who were here and the teachers who were here. And I've spent the rest of my life trying to be a learner and a teacher. And you never stop being a learner even when you are a teacher. And what binds us all together in this room, whether it's 61 or 80 or 2011, is that we all have had that light bulb experience in the classroom with really smart people sitting around us, including our classmates and a professor, where the light bulbs have gone on, and I hear, I'm here to tell the rest of you, it will never go off. It will never go off. You'll have it on for the rest of your life. And I hope you appreciate that, because this program, I think, is the crown jewel of Providence College. And I 
want to thank Dr. Lynch for, and all the faculty here for their hard work. Uh, this is a dinner that I don't miss. I'm not going to Midnight Madness tonight. I'm going to be here instead because this is much more important. And I think that we can be justifiably proud of what we do here at Providence College. So I'm happy to be a part of this. We thank God for what it is that we've received as a gift. And I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Father Shanley. Uh, many of you know that Father Shanley has taught a course in honors, honors ethics. It would always fill up right away. And he's not doing it this year. And I think it's about time he stopped slacking off and, and come back to work. All right? So when you see him around campus, you might want to remind him that he's a teacher at heart. No program can succeed without support. And much of it goes on behind the scenes. One of the most dedicated supporters of the program is Jack Partridge, um, class of 1961, Jack has been the primary instigator in raising money for what we call the Thompson Fund. Most of you have benefited from this fund. Several are going off to the Rhode Island Philharmonic tomorrow night. Those tickets don't cost $10. They cost $35. You pay $10. Jack pays the rest. Right? <laughs> um, if you're not going to the Philharmonic, perhaps you've been to the RISD Museum with Dr. Grace, or you're going to the Philharmonic later this semester with Dr. Grace, or you've been on the, tri on the trips to Vienna and Munich uh, or Rome, or you're going to Greece and Turkey and Crete and Rhodes uh, this spring. Um, all of these uh, co-curricular activities are supported in part uh, by the Thompson Fund, thanks to Jar Jack Partridge and a group of very faithful alums, many of whom are here tonight. I just want to mention that stuff is cheap or free now, but it's not going to be cheap or free until you turn 65 again. So when these opportunities come up, respond to Eve's email, sign up immediately. All right? You want to take advantage of these great opportunities. Um, none of this would be pop possible without our faithful alums and with Jack Partridge leading the way. So we are all in his debt. Please welcome Jack Partridge. All I can say is, uh, Really, I'm embarrassed after that, because that's not exactly what I thought he was going to say. I thought he was going to be witty again, but he wasn't. <laughs> uh, Father Shanley, uh, Steve Lynch, Susan Fornia, members of the faculty at the Arts Honors Program, other members of the faculty, uh, graduates of the program who have been so supportive, uh, students. We're very, very pleased to be supportive of your efforts as students, because that's what it's all about. I'm very pleased to say that the college has authorized the formation of a Liberal Arts Honors Council, Leadership Council. And we had our first organizational meeting tonight before, before this convocation. Uh, it's a, a group of 16 uh, alumni uh, of, the, of the college from 61 to, uh, I think the last one is 90, uh, 2004. A, uh, a young lady who was uh, just beginning her legal career at a major law firm in Atlanta. Um, it's a, so it's a disparate group. We uh, are, our demographics and where we live and what we do is very different. But we think it's sort of a, a group that is reflective of uh, the alumni of the, of the program, in, including uh, those who are, are here tonight and those who are uh, among the many who are around the country, in fact, around the world, serving in many different capacities. We're now at a point, however, when you talk about class of 61, the conversation's more about aches and pains and uh, retirement uh, than it used to be. But uh, we're still pretty vigorous at the class of 61. We'll be having our 50th reunion, and it's going to be probably the best reunion uh, that's ever been on this campus because of the committee uh, and the things they have planned, uh, which you'll hear about later on. And you'll want to do the same thing when you become, a, become an alum. Uh, let me talk about the, uh, the, the, issue for the, the issues for the council. Our mission statement is very, very simple. Um, first of all, a vision statement, I should say. We're developing, assisting in developing a liberal arts honors program, graduates who will change the world. 
So our challenge to everyone is change the world. Very, very similar, of course, to that which we all know relates to the college. And what we want to do is expose the students of the program and faculty to speakers who are leaders in, in, in the world, in their fields. We want to sponsor a student faculty enrichment programs and opportunities. We'd like to have a vibrant arts honors program, alumni program, uh, with planned activities, and hopefully those will be focused on you, the undergraduates in the program. And we'd like to grow the Thompson Fund to support and expand these programs, as, as previously, uh, previously indicated. Uh, we're a very enthusiastic group. Uh, we really do believe in the program. All of us share our experience tonight uh, with respect to what it's meant to us. And just as in the case of what Father Shanley was talking about, uh, it was our path to our various, various careers. So we're very, very pleased to be, be involved in, in that activity. I'd ask the members of the council who are here to be stand and be recognized. I know we got quite a few, so would you mind stand, be standing and, and being recognized? I'm not going to go through all the names, but if you look at the back of, um, of the uh, program tonight, you'll see a, a list of the convocation speakers. Several of the members of the council have been convocation speakers, uh, but this is a very reflective group of alumni, and, and we uh, urge you to, to think about being an alumni participant in the programs in the future. It's very important for the growth of the program you're now in to, in fact, um, look at this, think about it, and be part of it in the future. So we, your alumni, are enthusiastic about the program. We know it has benefited you and will benefit you, and uh, you'll never forget it. Thank you very much. I had a, a great lunch this afternoon with one of the members of the Leadership Council, Bob Walsh, and he was uh, telling me that of his, the ten top teachers in his life, five of them were at Providence College and two of them were in high school. None of them were at Harvard Law School. <laughs> so there's two lessons there. One is you should have come to PC in the 60s when we were really good. Just kidding. The other is when you're accepted at Harvard Law, just say no. So tonight we, uh, we award the De La Santa Award. This is an award in honor of our beloved colleague, Rodney De La Santa, who taught at the college for 46 years, from 1961 to 2007. He also directed the honors program for 17 years, and he was a dear, dear friend of mine. The De La Santa Award is for the best essay written by a freshman in Freshman Honors uh, uh, Development of Western Civilization. And this year's award goes to Lindsay Maracanacho. Come on. Very gracefully done. Thank you. You can exit that. <laughs> She wrote that paper for Bill Hudson, not for me. All right. So Bill deserves some of the credit. You should uh, think about splitting the check with him. <laughs> the Thompson Award is given to the student, or in this case, students, voted by faculty as the most outstanding student, students, uh, in his or her class to complete the honor sequence. The award is named in honor of Paul Van K. Thompson, the founder of the Liberal Arts Honors Program in 1957. And this year's winners, I understand there's no suspense whatsoever, it's right there in front of you. Michael Wall and Nathan Ritchie. that used to be friends. 
I'd like to invite Father Gabriel Pavarnik to give the invocation. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we, the children of your covenant, give you thanks this night. Thanks for the gift of wisdom which you have imparted upon us as we recognize that all of our achievements, all of the graces that we have received are to your glory and not our own. We ask you to bless the time that we share together this evening, that the food and fellowship that we share might always remind us of the graces that you pour forth upon us. May the abundance of this night remind us always of the abundance of your spirit as we come ever closer to you and to the eternal life that you have promised us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father Gabriel. I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at my notes carefully enough. I just want to invite Corey Plant to come up for a moment here uh, to speak about the Student Advisory Committee. We just started this week, and, and these people are energetic. They, they are taking over. All right. Come on up, Corey. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lynch. Um, you know, it's always been amazing to me that the Liberal Arts Honors Program is so much more than just something academically based. Uh, even just looking around here, it is so much more about community. Uh, some of the best and brightest professors that PC has to offer is right here in this room, including some of my absolute best friends or some of the smartest people that I know. Uh, but kind of uh, reflecting on what Father Shanley was saying just a few minutes ago, it really is amazing when the things you learn in Civ collide with real life. I remember just a few years ago when I went to, Ro to Rome on one of those honor spring break trips. I'm sure some of you have heard this story before. Uh, but it was about 2 a.m. and we were just sitting on the front steps of the Pantheon just marveling about how we had learned about this temple to all the gods that the Romans built in Civ. And yet there we were actually there in person being able to relish in how beautiful of a place it really was. Um, and granted, it was very painful the next morning when we got that 5.30 a.m. wake-up call on three and a half hours of sleep, but I'd say it was honestly worth it. Um, but it's the experiences like that that really enrich the experience for students when you get to really come outside of that academic spectrum and really see how you can apply what you've learned through the honors program into your real life. Uh, we've the honors program, in addition to those spring break trips, have done things in the past like have movie nights where I've had the pleasure and privilege of seeing uh, the best films I've ever seen, including Citizen Kane, Rules of the Game, other really great films like that. Uh, as well as last year, we went to PPAC to see uh, a production of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Uh, and getting together as professors and students and being able to enjoy these things in a community aspect is a really great thing, uh, which is part of why Dr. Lynch just a few weeks ago sent me an email uh, saying, we've got some money that we want to spend. Uh, so we want to get some students together to figure out how we can do that. So as you can attest, the email I sent back was, I love spending money. I'll be there at four. Uh, so we do have some great things uh, for the works uh, this upcoming year. Uh, maybe going off campus to see a few plays or even uh, if any of you are familiar with the Avon Cinema down on Thayer Street. Uh, they do have a lot of very intellectual scholarly productions, uh, both indie flicks uh, as well as international films. I actually know this weekend they're having a movie about Allen Ginsberg's Howl there. Uh, that could be something that we could enjoy. Uh, but the first thing that we do have on the books is going to be a sort of a meet and greet between students and professors. So consider this your formal invitation, Honors Program Professors, uh, for Friday, November 5th uh, in the Campus Ministry Center. Uh, it should be a very great time. Uh, but keep, uh, keep your ears and eyes open for events throughout the year. Uh, we're lo really looking to foster that sense of community amongst each and every person in this room. Uh, so thank you for your time, and enjoy dinner. Thank you, Corey. Um, one of the best things about those trips abroad is watching the expressions on the faces of students as they get on the bus at 6 a.m. <laughs> it's my favorite part. And uh, Corey, keep in mind the money you're spending is alumni money. That's good news. Bad news is someday you'll be an alum. All right? 
and you'll be generous. So everyone, please enjoy your dinner. So welcome, Dr. Grace. When Dr. Lynch invited me to introduce my former student, Jane Gonzalez, I had to decide whether to follow the traditional routine of telling you that Ms. Gonzalez received her degree from Providence College in 1980, that she majored in economics, that she is a senior claims specialist for Hanover Insurance Company, etc., or whether I should do something more uh, lighthearted. At my peril, I decided to follow the latter course. So I shall not be telling you that Jane Gonzalez has been elected to the New Bedford City Council nine times, that she has twice served as president of the City Council, that she has served in numerous community organizations, including the New Bedford Preservation Society, the YMCA of Southeastern Massachusetts, and New Bedford's uh, uh, Waterfront Historic Area League, and that she has been honored with awards from the Providence College Alumni Association, the New Bedford chapter of the Prince Henry Society, and the New Bedford Preservation Society. I won't tell you any of that. Instead of telling you about those things, I've chosen to tell you a story about something that happened many years ago when Jane was an undergraduate in the illustrious class of 1980 several of whose illustrious members are here tonight. First, I have to reconstruct the geography of the campus as it was in 1978. What is now Moore Hall was then Antoninus Hall. And what is now the Feinstein Center was then Stephen Hall. And what is now Lawn between Aquinas and Feinstein was then a parking lot. Those of you who are from foreign parts, like New York or Texas, uh, can now perhaps begin to understand why people in Rhode Island are apt to say things like, turn left when you get to what used to be Stephen Hall, across from where there used to be a parking lot. Well, on a lovely spring afternoon in 1978, I was driving my red station wagon past Antoninus, headed towards Stephen, with the intention of parking in the lot there and going into my office downstairs in Stephen. I was, at that time, I was director of the honors program. As so often happens along that route, it's right by the stairs that go down to Raymond, students are oblivious to motor vehicle traffic while they saunter from one building to another. So I came up behind a group of six or seven students, all members of the honors program, class of 1980, who upon turning and spotting me behind the wheel issued a defiant but good-natured, thou shalt not pass. <laughs> One of the students was Jane Gonzalez. I think Mike Mulligan was among them, and perhaps Danny Otero, and maybe the current president of PC. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't remember all six or seven members of the group. I smiled back and inched forward. In no time, Jane Gonzalez, now leading the renegade pack, had seated herself on the hood of my car, <laughs> acting like a fashion model out of one of those old General Motors Motorama national tours that had the pretty girl behind, beside the latest model Buick. You know? Now, I've never owned a Mercedes or a Jaguar or a Cadillac, all of which have iconic hood ornaments. My colleagues who had such cars had them stolen from campus or in the neighborhood. But here I was with uh, an attractive, living, breathing, smiling hood ornament. <laughs> I was one up on Jaguar and Packard and Lincoln. My hood ornament was better than any of theirs. <laughs> we had our banter. They let me pass, and most of them forgot the episode, I'm sure. I doubt very much 
that Jane remembers it as I am describing it, but it is a true story. The next day, as I got behind the wheel of the car, I noticed a little dent on the hood. <laughs> right where Jane had been sitting and smiling. <laughs> and for the remaining years that I had that old station, every time I got into the car, I remembered Jane. <laughs> as the dent became my phantom hood ornament. I need to tell you that Jane was a sprightly young woman, so the dent was pretty small. N nothing on the order of the mark that would be left if you parked your car in the Lansdowne Street lot beyond the Green Monster and some gargantuan slugger crunched the home run directly into your car, as occasionally happens. Nevertheless, Jane traveled with the Graces for several years after that jovial moment between Antoninus and Stephen. As I thought about that occasion when we were all in our salad days, for I was young then too, I wondered what possible connection I could make to Jane's career in public service, as you no doubt are also wondering at this moment. <laughs> then it occurred to me that New Bedford had hoon ornaments long before Bentley or Rolls Royce had winged victory or swans or archers on their bonnets. Herman Melville saw them, Joshua Slocum saw them, anyone working on the New Bedford waterfront in the age of sail saw them. On the prow of most larger sailing vessels, just under the bowsprit, there was a figure, usually looking down at the waves, there to protect the vessel. These figureheads, as they were called, could be seen on commercial vessels, including New Bedford whalers, as well as on military vessels. The figure might be a lion or Hercules or Pegasus, but most often it was a female figure. A few of them seem to have lost an item or two of apparel in the course of chasing whales, but most of them are quite proper. In common usage nowadays, the word figurehead connotes a position of symbolic leadership, but without any real authority or influence. That is definitely not our chain. She is a figurehead for New Bedford in the old sense of the seafarer's lore. For nearly 20 years, she has been a protector of the city, guiding the whale cities, whaling city's ship of state over waters both rough, both rough and smooth. So this is the story of how Jane Gonzalez went from being a living, breathing, smiling hood ornament to being a smart, dedicated, effective, and still smiling figurehead for the city that has been her home for her whole life. Please join me in welcoming home <laughs> Jane Gonzalez. Good evening. Wow, if I was nervous before, <clears throat> that is very tough to beat. Um, I am so honored to be here before you today. Father Shanley, faculty members, students, alumni, and my friends from the class of 80. I'd like to thank those of you that were involved in the decision to allow me to speak this evening, Dr. Lynch, who I want you to know I tried to talk out of it. Dr. Grace for that fabulous introduction. It's truly wonderful. And all this time I'm thinking, what embarrassing thing is he going to remember that I've forgotten? But yet, even though it was somewhat embarrassing, he, made, he wove a beautiful story, and I appreciate that. I also want to thank my friends who I called in the last week to get recollections and reassurance from, because as I said, I'm pretty nervous. I speak on a regular basis, obviously, in the council chamber when I debate. But coming back to my alma mater, as Father Shanley said, when you imagine coming back, and I never thought that I'd be speaking to a room full of people in this, this distinguished company in this great school, my alma mater. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. My grandparents, all four of them, emigrated from Portugal. My parents were working class people. And I was fortunate to get a scholarship to Providence College and to be invited to be in the honors program. 
it was a pretty big deal in my family. At that time, there was only about 20 of us in the program. <clears throat> and I thought, coming into the program, being second in my class in a small high school in New Bedford, that I was pretty big stuff. Then I got here, <laughs> and I found that I was in a group of 20 pretty big stuff people. There were people in that class that had amazing majors, double majors of philosophy and physics, our friend Michael, and people with perfect SAT scores, and people like my friend Peter Comerford who could debate on anything endlessly, not necessarily that he was correct, but <laughs> as I just commented to Father Shanley, Father Shanley just Googled something during dinner to look up, to read something to us, and we said, I said to him, wouldn't it have been wonderful to have that that access in a civ seminar when Peter was going on and on, sounding absolutely assured about his position, and he was wrong. <laughs> Although the Rousseaus often were able to access the information from somewhere in their in their minds and and uh, refute him, but we didn't have the access to iPhone apps that you do. You know, it, the funny thing about this was I, when I was thinking about the, the story that Dr. Grace might tell, I, one came to me right away. And as I said, I, I was in a group of, you know, an elite group of 20 students, and they were all really, really smart. And here I was from New Bedford, and I was what I like to call well-rounded. Um, I wasn't one that you'd find in the library late at night. You would find me at Brad's. Um, I was there pretty much every night. And... Late, though. I would go study, but then I would go later. I was also a hockey cheerleader, which is, there are no longer any hockey cheerleaders at Providence College, but I was a hockey cheerleader, and one year, I think it was sophomore year, the team was in the playoffs, and at that time we had to travel, so they were playing at Clarkson, which is in Potsdam, New York, which is pretty close to the border. And I went to Dr. Grace and I said, I know that we have our Civ midterm tomorrow, but, um, or actually I guess it was the next day, I just wanted you to know that I'll be here, but I'm going to Potsdam by bus for the entire day, and I will be back just in time, probably, for the final or the midterm. He was not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> the point I want to make, though, is that the honors program and the honors experience probably set us apart from the other students in a lot of ways. There was only 20 of us, as I've said, and I think that we became a family of sorts. But it was brought home to me again recently. I was here in June for my 30th reunion, and people were talking about CIV, like PC alumnus always do, because it's such a big experience, part of the experience here. And they were talking about, and this was amazing to me, about not going to class, first of all, which I can't imagine missing a class, and then going to the lab, to language lab, to listen to the CIV lecture on tape. And we didn't have access to that. So that might be the reason our attendance was so good, because you couldn't make it up if you didn't get, if you didn't get to class. You know, and in contrast to their exper experience of CIV, we had a two-hour seminar in the afternoons. And this brings me to a great recollection that I want to thank my friend Peter for. One of the classes that we had, which was on a Wednesday afternoon, was called Dimensions of Art. And it was supposed to be our cultural experience, or one of them. And one of our professors was Father Coskrin. And Father Koskin would speak often about music. And being the 70s, we listened to records. And Father Koskin would start to conduct the orchestra as the record played. And I know I could see my friends laughing with it. He would, he would conduct. And as the afternoon went on, fueled by a few pony-sized beers, he would conduct with more gusto. <laughs> and pretty soon, his eyes would be closed, and he'd be conducting. And he would be so vehemently conducting and bobbing his head that his comb over would come forward on occasion. And he would just swipe it back and continue. And that's a, a great memory to have. But he also taught us about opera, about, the, about classical music. And one of my favorite recordings ever, a recording of uh, Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald singing Gershwin. So, so those are experiences that I had in the honors program, things I will never forget. But it, not only did I learn to have, have experiences like that and learn about the great classics and literature and art, I made great friends and I had wonderful memories.
but also very importantly, as I alluded to earlier, the experience of having the CIV seminar and learning to develop a thesis, develop a hypothesis, and defend that, and debate that, to develop a strategy, to implement a plan. Those are all things that I learned from my honors experience. And those things and that part of that experience is probably what directly relates to what I do today. I, didn't, I wasn't the kind of kid that ran for student government and always wanted to be involved in politics, although it was certainly a regular discussion in, in my household growing up. My parents were always interested in local government. But I wasn't overly active in it as a student. And yet when I look back, I know that one of the things I cared about was community. And I had a community experience in the honors program. And I went back to New Bedford to be part of that community. And I realized that the way to be part of that community was to get involved. JFK said, political action is the highest responsibility of a citizen. Now, I'd love to tell you that that's what I was thinking of when I ran for office. But really, the first time I ran for office, what I was thinking was, I can do a better job than that guy. <laughs> so luckily for me, because my, my ambition and my uh, chutzpah were probably greater than my, than my planning, um, I was able to um, win office my first try. I became a city councilor um, in 1994. And I've been in, in office in the City Council of Bedford ever since. But what I've learned through the years is, although the job duties, if you look them up in the city charter, tell us that we, as city councilors, are responsible for approving the budget, approving mayoral, mayoral appointments, and legislating local laws. In fact, a city councilor is really a facilitator, a confessor of sorts, an enforcer, a deal maker, and in many times, I'm the voice of the person who calls me. And I have found through the years that people believe that someone has to intercede for them, and as time goes on, more and more times where the community breaks down, they can't just go knock on their neighbor's door. They can't go complain because the neighbors have an allowed party. Or they can't complain because they think the neighbor might be running a business in a residential zone. Now I'm getting to the real specifics of what I do now. But they need someone to intercede for them. And that's where I come in. People call me and they have a problem. And somehow through the years, I've learned how to fix their problems. Or know who to go to that can fix their problem. And as time goes on, 17 years later, nine terms later, I still love it. Now, sometimes, as Mrs. Lynch was asking me, you know, people can be demanding, and people can be crotchety, and people are unreasonable. And in this time of recession, when there were so many cuts, people, you know, city governments have laid off many, many employees, just like any other business in a recession. People do not accept the answer that I can't fix that for them, or that if I can fix it, it will take a while. That yes, their sidewalk might be broken and someone might have tripped on it, but I can't get it repaired for two or three or six months. That yes, their neighbor may be doing something wrong next door and they might be having some business in that residential property, but I may not be able to get the building inspector out for two weeks or three weeks or four. And so the key to what I do, or the, the challenge to what I do, I guess I should say, is trying to help those people to be their voice, to continue to make city government work while recognizing the problems that we face and empathizing with those people's problems. And as time goes on, I realize that that's the role I was meant to play. And it's funny because, as Dr. Grace mentioned, actually if you asked me, I guess I would tell you that I'm a claims adjuster. But because that's my day job, that's what I call it, my day job. But when I decided to run for office that first time 18 years ago, I had no idea what the world was opening up to me and how much I would enjoy what I'm doing. And if you ask me now, I would tell you that is what I'm meant to do. That is my way of improving my little corner of the earth and helping people. And I think that in this time, especially when people have become so cynical about government, it's important to note that even at my small level of local government that I believe in what I do 
that I want to help people and that I can make a difference. And I would urge all the students to think about that as they go forward. Public service is the most important thing you can do. And whether it's elected or volunteer or appointed, be a real member of your community. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. If I have a problem, I know who to call. If I need a, a hood ornament, I know who to call. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, the people who, who made this uh, night what it is. First of all, the Sodexo staff, who always do a great job. I think a round of applause is well deserved. I'd also like to thank Eve, our graduate student, who's always there answering the phone, responding to emails. And Dr. Suzanne Fournier, who was the, the brains behind the operation. Um, in fact, I think Eve and Dr. Fournier and I are thinking about going into the wedding planning business. We have lots of good experience. Um, so I wish everyone a good night. There's no need to hurry. I hear Dr. Barber is offering signatures half price tonight. All right, so this is your opportunity. So enjoy your evening. Please linger and socialize all you want. Thanks.